song that we'll be singing tonight that's it on page 431 uh, the words and the music was written by Elijah Hoffman he was born in 1839 in Orwigsburg Pennsylvania anybody ever hear of that little town Orwigsburg or, Wig, yeah, or Wigsburg. Okay. It's about uh, 60 some miles from Harrisburg. So if you have, down that neck of the woods. And uh, I think the 2020 census only had a little under 3,000 population. So it maybe even back in his day in 1840, may even been less. I don't know. Uh, and he died in. 1929 in Chicago, Illinois, at the age of 90. He was a Presbyterian minister, composer of over 2,000 hymns, and edited over 50 songbooks. Uh, his father was also a Presbyterian minister. Often grew up singing sacred hymns both in church and in home with his parents. After finishing high school, Hoffman furthered his education at the Union Seminary in New Berlin, Pennsylvania, and he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister in 1873. Okay, so if you take your song book and turn to page 431, give him the glory. 431. Thank you. 
283. 283. What a day that will be. choices. Life is full of choices. We choose our cars, we choose our homes, our jobs, our classes. We choose to be good employees or poor employees. 
We choose to be good parents or bad parents. We choose to pay our bills or to allow the collector to come for them. Life is made up of choices. Some are not aware of it, but we choose the attitudes that dictate our lives every day. Our attitudes are not so much based upon our circumstances as they are our choice to either be positive or negative in those circumstances. Success has never been part of the life that is constantly negative. The choice of attitude serves up several lessons for us. Our attitude determines our approach to life. Our attitude determines our relationships with people. Our attitude is the only difference between success and failure. Our attitude at the beginning of a task will affect the outcome more than anything else. Our attitude can turn our problems into blessings. Our attitude can give us an uncommonly positive perspective. Our attitude is not automatically good just because we are filled with the Spirit. we got to keep that in mind. Just because we're filled with the Spirit doesn't mean our attitude is automatically good. We have to choose to have the right attitude in different circumstances. George Moore quoted the following, The difficulty in life is the choice, unquote. God chooses what we go through, but we choose how we're going to go through it. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Shall we stand please in honor of God's word? Hebrews 11, we'll begin with verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, notice choice, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. And my text this evening is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of serving you and knowing you and looking into your word. And Lord, when we think of all the choices that we make every day, Lord, help us, Lord, as as pulling this people to continue to make the right choices so we can make it to heaven one of these days and we truly believe thy coming is so near even at the door. Blessed in every part of this message and service tonight and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Life is made up of choices as well as consequences. There are some circumstances concerning which you and I have had no choice whatsoever. You could not choose your parents, and you could not choose the nation into which you were born. I'm glad I was born in the United States of America, by the way. You could not choose the date of your birth or the world situation into which you were born. The past has been formed by the choices made by your parents and your response or reaction to these choices. A story is told of two brothers. One of them would carry a letter to the grave that could have set the record straight, but I will tell you about that later. There was a man whose name was Edwin Thomas, a master of the stage. He was a great actor. During the latter half of the 1800s, this small man with a huge voice had few rivals. Debuting in Richard III at the age of 15, he found unrivaled success with his abilities to act out the great dramas of Shakespeare. In New York City, for 100 consecutive nights, he performed Hamlet, and even in London, where the tough British critics lived, he won favor in their hearts with his acting skills. He was very gifted as an actor. When it came to difficulties in life, Edwin Thomas was quite acquainted with those also. 
Edmund Thomas was not alone, for he had two brothers, John and Junius. They too were actors, although they were not nearly as gifted as Edwin was. In 1863, the three brothers performed together in Julius Caesar. The fact that Edwin's brother took the role of Brutus was almost an eerie foreboding of what was to occur in the brothers' lives in just two years. One little choice or decision would not only affect the brothers, but an entire nation. This same John who played the assassin in Julius Caesar is the same John who would play the role of assassin in Ford's theater. On a dark April night in 1865, with the Civil War pulling at the heart and soldiers of a divided nation, John walked into the theater and fired a bullet at the head of Abraham Lincoln. See, the last name of the brothers was Booth. Edwin Thomas Booth and John Wilkes Booth. That night would mark Edwin forever. He would never be the same again. The shame from his brother's crime drove him into retirement. He might have never returned to the stage had it not been for a twist of fate at a New Jersey train station. Edwin was awaiting his coach when a well-dressed young man, pressed by the crowd, lost his footing and fell between the platform and the moving train. Without hesitation, Edwin locked a leg around the railing, grabbed the man, and pulled him to safety. After the sighs of relief, the young man recognized the famous Edwin Booth. Edwin, however, did not recognize the young man whom he had rescued. That knowledge would come to him a few weeks later in a letter that he received, a letter that he would carry in his pocket to his grave, a letter from General Adams Bedeau, Chief Secretary to General Ulysses S. Grant, a letter thanking Edwin Booth for saving the life of the child of an American hero, Abraham Lincoln. How ironic that while one brother killed the president, the other brother saved the president's son. The boy that was yanked to safety was none other than Robert Todd Lincoln. You see, you never know who you might be helping or hindering in the choices we make or you make every single day of your life. As your pastor, I'd like to, I pray that you will all continue to choose to serve God rather than mammon or money. You cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6, 24. We live in a secularized world where the scientific approach to life is emphasized. Great emphasis is placed on achieving material success. A Hindu merchant in Hong Kong was observed burning a candle before an image at the beginning of the business day. Inquiry revealed that he was making a sacrifice to the money god. You see, he believed that the money god could give him financial success. He declared that this was the first thing on his agenda every single morning. The world's strong emphasis on economic success would encourage you to live and me to live your life dedicated fully and completely to the search for mammon. Live for something more than profit. Live for something more than position. Live for something greater than power. Live for something more than privilege. Second, we pray that each one here tonight will choose to sow to the spirit rather than to the flesh. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. In our flesh we are kin to the animal kingdom. In our mind and soul we are related to God. While living in the flesh, in the world, we must recognize that our higher nature is in the realm of the spirit. We are something more than intelligent animals walking around on two feet. You see, the per every person is made in the image and likeness of God. He has an inner hunger.
that cannot be satisfied with anything except the knowledge of and a relationship to God. As we give attention to preparing our mind, don't forget your soul. Determine that you will, not, you will be, not be content with a childhood concept of God. Grow up in your concept of God. In other words, as your knowledge of the world increases, make certain that your knowledge of God deepens and grows every day. Choices. I'm talking about choices tonight. How you're going to live every day in your priorities. At the beginning of flight training, a student flies with an instructor by his side over familiar terrain and in perfect weather. All his decisions are based on sight. But at the end, when a student pilot receives his instrument rating, he has learned to fly by himself over unfamiliar terrain and in total darkness. He has learned to trust not his sight, but his instruments, such as a compass, altimeter, airspeed, and radar. He has learned to fly blind. Just as the flight instructor's ultimate goal is to see a student get his instrument rating, so the father in Proverbs had the same goal for his son. What is the spiritual equivalent of an instrument rating? It's trusting in the Lord, not in one's own understanding. Every parent, teacher, and leader knows his protégés will one day encounter darkness, storms, and unfamiliar terrain in life. The key to their graduation and promotion is learning to live by faith and not by sight. Flying blind in life doesn't mean closing your eyes. It means keeping them on the Lord. As we mature in life, I trust the Lord will help all of us to keep a humble spirit and take the blame at times because we all make mistakes at times, don't we? The statements below are taken from actual insurance accident claims forms. Anybody ever been an insurance agent? Anybody at all been You've been insurance? Sorry. I can't imagine the, the letters they get in forms where people are trying to get money out of for free. Let me give you some tonight. This insurance agent we received in the mail. I quote, I left for work this morning at 7 a.m. as usual when I collided straight into a bus. The bus was five minutes early. Clearly the bus is out. <laughs> Second, I knew the dog was possessive about the car, but I would not have asked her to drive it if I had thought there was any risk. How could he have known? <laughs> the accident happened because I had one eye on the truck in front one eye on the pedestrian and the other on the car behind. Clearly God's fault. More eyes needed. <laughs> no one was to blame for the accident, but it would have never happened if the other driver had been alert. <laughs> you see, we live in a culture of blame instead of taking personal responsibility. The Bible is different in that it very much supports personal responsibility for the choices and the decisions that we make every day. I like what Eleanor Roosevelt said, and I quote, One's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It is expressed in the choices one makes. In the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die. And the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility, unquote. As your pastor, we pray that you all choose to enter the narrow gate of disciplined living rather than the broad way of shallow drifting. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it, Matthew 7, 13, and 14. No one becomes a scholar automatically or accidentally. You see, scholarship is the result of a desire 
that is followed by a decision to make diligent inquiry and comprehensive study of some field of knowledge, and this requires discipline. One does not become an outstanding athlete accidentally. One may possess a wonderful physique and have a splendid muscular coordination. However, these, not con these do not constitute athletic prowess. One does not become a medical doctor merely because he has the desire to become one. Desire must be matched with decision and discipline. To follow the course of study that leads to a medical degree that requ requires that one eliminate many available electives and options. The mighty minority who achieve significance are those who live a disciplined life. Jesus speaks of the gate being small and the way being narrow that leads to the abundant life. He is referenced to that narrow gate of decisiveness and the disciplined life of dedicated living. No one can become a dedicated Christian apart from the discipline that makes the will of God the top priority of their daily living. We pray that you will choose to serve rather than to be served. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. So how do we as Christians tonight define success? Do we think in terms of stocks and bonds, farms and property? Do we think in terms of a beautiful home and the latest model automobile? Do we define success primarily in terms of the things that you can acquire and enjoy in this life? If you want to find the highest success possible, you must do so by defining success in terms of service to others. Jesus, in fact, warned his disciples against the error of thinking of greatness in terms of exercising authority and control over others. He said, and I quote, Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, Matthew 20, verses 26 and 27. See, Jesus paid for us a word picture of a man who thought of success in terms of being served rather than serving. The rich farmer was eminently successful in planning and following a procedure that produced an abundance of material things. These things made it possible for him to be served by others. The divine verdict is that this man followed a policy of foolishness because he thought only in terms of himself. He forgot God, he forgot others, and he forgot eternity. He was living to be served rather than to serve. There are two final, two final destinies in life. Often during political campaigns, voters are heard to say that they feel frustration because there seems to be no real good choice they can make when it comes to voting the right politician in, kind of like we're facing in two months. This is not true with regard to spiritual matters that determine final destinies. Only a fool would spend a lifetime on the road of life and never stop to ask where he was going. <laughs> there is a heaven. The Bible pictures heaven in terms of a place of unhampered life where the fullness of God intended will be experienced. I'm looking forward to that day. It's a place where there's no fleshly limitations and no destructiveness of sin. But then there's also a hell. A lot of people don't believe there is a hell, but there is a hell because it tells about it in the Bible. This is described in the scripture as a place of outer darkness where there is eternal sorrow and regret. The greatest earthly similarity that Jesus could use to describe hell was that of a city dump where the maggots never died and the fires never stopped burning. We've got to keep in mind that our culture today Whatever the culture out there is saying, we, they can never be trusted. You see, the Broadway is filled with multitudes of people, but it is the way of destruction. The narrow way of, to life is not crowded, by the way. Often one must travel alone on the narrow way. The crowd becomes a Judas goat that leads to the unthinking multitudes to the slaughter just as the stockyards use a Judas goat to lead animals to their death by calming them with the innocent ringing of the bell about the goat's neck. In the German war camps, 
Hundreds of Jews were led to death under the guise of going to take a shower. Once inside the building, they learned too late that the shower outlet spewed forth poisonous gas. Likewise, Satan uses the alarmment of the world to disguise his deadly game of death. We must decide for ourselves the broad way or the narrow way. We pray that each one of us here tonight will choose the will of God as the roadmap of life, the narrow way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is on earth. Remember, once you've chosen the narrow way, you must stay on the narrow way and don't take a detour and get off the path. Remember, the will of God is not something to be avoided at all cost. The will of God is not something that we must endure with dread. God's will is all-inclusive and comprehensive, and it leads to the highest possible joy and achievement in life. God's will is always ultimately best for us and best for others. Don't forget the choices we make every day affect those around us. Remember, God is a good God. He loves us to the extent that he gave his son to die for us on the cross. All of his purposes and plans for us are purposes of love. To find the will of God for your life and mine is life's greatest discovery. To do the will of God in your life is life's greatest achievement. I trust the Lord will help each of us these days to make the right choices for all eternity. I'd like to close by singing page 482 and sing to the Lord, I give all to you. So let's all stand as we sing page 482 and sing to the Lord, I give all to you. Yes, Jesus.